Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hello, everyone. David Temple here for The Thriller Zone. And today I'm very excited about my special guest, John Gilstrap, author of Blue Fire. I've been trying to get this guy for some time, so I'm very psyched to have him here. If you're a beginning writer, perhaps, there's some great advice inside the show. Are you a cocktail lover like me? There's some fun stuff at the top of the show with the green room. And in between, there's great storytelling, again, great advice, good insights from a guy who is probably one of the nicest, most down-to-earth cats I have ever met. Let me stop talking and get into the Thriller Zone. How you doing? You're as handsome as I saw you on your website. (laughs) Then clearly the airbrushing is working. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, John Gilstrap. How are you, sir? I am good. Welcome to the Thriller Zone. Thank you. I have been, yes, I have been looking forward to this too. And uh, we're going to be talking about Blue Fire today, uh, which, oh, nerve wracking. Yeah, you do. Yours looks prettier. Uh, (laughs) I'm telling you what, dude, uh, I'm going to say this out of the gate. May I call you, dude? It just looks Oh, absolutely. You can call me whatever you want. Okay. Uh, nerve wracking. That was, that is what I would, uh, that's my takeaway of blue fire. Well, good. Yeah. All right. We're going to talk about Victoria Emerson and uh, all of the nerve wracking, uh, melee and so forth. But uh, I, I want to say, uh, first of all, one thing I have really enjoyed about what I would call pre getting to know you is your accessibility, availability, and kindness at every step. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, the reality is, you know, it, this is, I'm such a type A guy um, that getting to know people, I mean, the, the writing the books is a great vector to get to know p- more people. And I really like getting to know folks. So it, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. That's a really uh, good and healthy way to look at it because that's one of the, uh, borrowing that, one of the reasons I enjoy podcasts because, yeah, sure. Do I know how the machine works? Yeah. Do I like to read books? Of course. But I get to meet people like you that I never would have met before and make some kind of a connection, be it professional or emotional or friendly, you know, whatever. And it's, it's a really pretty cool place we're in, isn't it, John? It is. It is, and as much as I am tired of zooming, you know, as as the mechanism, the reality is, and you know, it, the blessings and curses all are very co- close to each other. So with all the lockdowns, all that stuff we've been going through, it's weird that there's actually more exposure to people, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's it's just it it's just me and the and the camera lens right you're over right. here but but you try to look in the lens when when you're talking sure and um where where it's i won't say bad where it's frustrating is when you're giving like a real speech to yeah. a group and you have no input 
you know, you have no idea what the other people are doing, if they're rolling their eyes, if they're laughing at your jokes, if you're, you know, it, it's, but um, in terms of podcasting and just interview, you know, I have tonight, every Wednesday night, I have a happy hour, a virtual happy hour, video happy hour with Jeffrey Deaver and, and Revis Wortham. Who's uh, Revis is a um, oh, stop uh, it writer. Yeah, so you know we eat for, we start with I'm a martini guy and you know and and Jeff's kind of a whiskey guy and and Revis drinks whatever something with gin in it and um, then we chat for an hour hour and a half and we you know it's kind of cool. I love that. And it's so funny you should say this. As a matter of fact, I think I'll just debut uh, uh, the idea right here on the show with you, if we may, if you'll just bear with me a second. Sure. Borrowing that and having watched my friends over at the crew reviews, I thought, you know, I'm always doing the show as we're doing it uh, right now at 9 a.m. my time. That's noon your time, right? Right. And um, I'm a morning guy because I did morning radio for 25 years, but... You know, there's nothing like kicking back around 5.30, 6 o'clock with a nice little icy beverage and hanging out with some of your friends. So I thought to myself, and I was saying this to a couple of people, what if we do a Thriller Zone late night edition where Daddy can get his groove on with a couple of guys? <laughs> well, there's nothing really wrong with day drinking, right? right. I mean, it doesn't, nine in the morning, my, you have a mimosa. That's... <laughs> John, you and I both know it starts with a mimosa and it goes downhill from there. It's fun. All right, quick question, because now that I'm on this, I, lo I love this spontaneous stuff. Uh, gin or vodka martini? Gin. A vodka martini is not a martini. A vodka martini is a vodka martini. A gin, a, a martini has gin, by definition, in my world. Okay, and you know what? I think somewhere in my uh, cocktail book of recipes, that would be confirmed. I feel a bell ringing. Ding. Um, and favorite gin? Beef eater. Old I like, school. Old school. I, I like to chew on juniper berries when I have my gin. I'm, I'm not into, you know, I mean, I think Hendrix is a good sipping gin, but once you get in all that herbal stuff, it doesn't work in a martini. It interferes with the olives, actually. So, but beef eater is by far my favorite. Now, let's take a second on that. It interferes with the olives. I've never thought about it that way because I'm a huge Hendrix fan, but you're right. There's a botanical mm -hmm. in your mouth. Yeah, but beef eater is straight ahead. It is. Beef eater is like Gilby's and... You know, it, it's it's the rail gin in most bars. So, you know, it also happens to be the cheapest martini. Yeah. Tell me this. What are your thoughts about the old school Tanqueray? Old, again, it, it's a little on the botanical side for me. And then when you get into Tanqueray 10, I, I just don't, I just don't like it. Okay. Well, I have a very bad memory, good memory, bad situation of uh, Tanqueray. Speaking of early morning drinking, I had a morning show in Chicago. We would, my producer and I would go downstairs afterwards and like, let's just relax a little bit after the show, we'll go back to work. And it was mm -hmm. Tanqueray, ta Tanqueray at the time. But at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, you don't get much work done after that. No, no, no. And I can't, um, the, for me, it was the great tequila incident of 1989 that um, <laughs> I can't get near tequila anymore. Uh, it was, and, and donuts were involved in it too. It was just, it was, it was just a bad thing. Now my wife turned me on and we're going to get off of this in a second. My wife okay. turned me on to mezcal no, no. tequila, which is smoked. I think it's smoked tequila, smoked, mm -hmm. uh, they, they smoke the plant. And I'm with you. I had a bad situation in 88 that I still to this day can recall. But uh, when I tried this, and I only have one tiny little sip, it's a, it's a very interesting, it's like guys who go, I'm a single malt scotch guy. Uh, I, I never drink blended. I am a scotch guy too, and I like the chew. I like Lagavulin, the real peaty stuff. Yeah. And you just can't get that in a blend. But but you're right, after, it depends on who's buying the drinks, right? So right. if somebody's buying them for you, then it really doesn't matter. Well, I'll tell you what, if we meet at Thriller Fest, if you go this year, mm -hmm. uh, I'll buy the first one. Okay. All, All right. right. That's a deal. Matter of fact, if it's single malt or gin martini without the word gin, we'll do mm -hmm. that. All right.
Oh, I meant to say olives, twist, or uh, 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 onion, pearl onion. Um, actually, a pearl onion is a Gibson, and I I I like those as well. But I'm kind of a, an olive guy. Okay, anchovy inside the olive. Last question. Um, pimento. Okay. Pimento. All right. This cocktail portion of the show has been sponsored by <laughs> Beef Eater Gin. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's just fun uh, green room chit chat. And now we'll get official. All right. Okay. Back back to Blue Fire. The thing that hit me out of the gate between the eyes was the premise upon which the book is built. And I don't think it's any great big secret. Mm -mm. It is what if a nuclear war destroys modern life as we know it. And John, my palms were sweating right out of the gate. Literally only because of this. It is written so uh uh it, it feels so real it feels like i read the headlines this morning and here is the book that is translating what has transpired oh well, thank you that's wonderful um yeah i i think the there's no spoiler in, in what the what the premise of of the book is about um this is actually, and I, I hope it succeeds as a standalone for people who do not read the first book in this series, which was Crimson Phoenix. Um, but the premise is that Victoria Emerson uh, was the, um, the House of Representatives representative for, the, uh, for a district in West Virginia. And there is, or there was, and I presume there still is, an evacuation bunker for the continuation of government. And this is a place where elected officials and one member of their staff. So in the case of the House and the Senate, that's 535 plus you know, times two. So it's an evacuation bunker for about a thousand people that will sustain um, the continuation of government for up at least 60 days or, or more. And the premise of the story is that Victoria can't, she's a single mom, her, her husband was killed in, in the sandbox and um, she finds out she can't bring her, her boys and so she quits. And she's something of a prepper and um, she's gonna roll the dice. She's not going to live while her boys get fried. So if, they're, if they live, they live together. If they fry, they fry together. And um, so the, the story really evolves into at least two parts. There's the Victoria survives the, the, the Holocaust. And then there's the, the government that is cloistered in, in the bunker. And all the best communications equipment in the world is in this bunker. This is real or was real. Um, I'm not dialed into that stuff anymore. Um, but all the best communication equipment in the world, but who's going to hear it? Right. So that's that's kind of the, that, that, that's the hanger on which the story is hung. Well, you know, we all think, damn, that's not going to be good when a nuclear war hits. And, and I know that sounds silly, but it, it, we all think that. But it, it isn't until you really start coming to grasp, coming to grips with the fact of, Exactly what does that mean? You know, I'm referred back to, it's one of my favorite books. One second after, I think. One second after. I think it's, it's Fortune, I believe is how you pronounce that. Fortune. I read that and I that was the first time I had really been awakened to the thought of, oh, what if that shit hits the fan? And uh, you start thinking, well, I can still do this. Oh, no, it ele takes electricity to get ga gasoline to pump. And then you think, well, I can do this. And all of a sudden, the trickle-down effect of the realization of what all simply collapses. Everything, you know, Everything. And, and without electricity, well, first of all, modern vehicles are fried because of the electromagnetic pulse, so none of that will work. And even if it would, without electricity, how do you get gas up out of the, out of the ground? How do, you, how do you pump it? Um, how do, what happens? And we saw in the early days of the pandemic, we saw the panic over things as trivial as toilet paper and hand sanitizer, right? Well, yeah. what happens when all of a sudden diabetic medication, nobody can get it. Uh, cancer patients no longer get their treatment. The, um, now what happens to society and how quickly does, does society evolve? And, you know, there's been a lot written about, and, you know, there's, there, there, some of the research for this takes me to interesting places. And, uh, there are a lot of folks that call themselves preppers. And actually, I, it's, it's a disparaging remark, I think, when it comes from most people, but I don't consider it that way. These are folks who are thinking ahead about, okay, 
how do I how do I take care of my family if if modern conveniences go away? Oh yeah. But in the Victoria Emerson series, I wanted to take it a step further because you know you can only stay in your bunker for so long. Mm-hmm. Sooner or later, you have to meet with other people, and if somebody comes up with their you know, they're starving baby, you're not going to shoot them because, you know, you got a bunker full of food and I hope you don't. And, and they need some of it. So a lot of these books is all about rebuilding society. And Victoria Emerson happens to be an outsider to this little town of Ortho, West Virginia, which is um, totally fictional. Sure. And she becomes the leader because she is the outsider. And, you know, there are some people I'm sure we've all run into them that even if they're not the official leader, you know, even if they don't have the stars on their collar or or they are in fact, the ones who lead people just naturally follow them. And Victoria is, is one of those. It's been a fun series to write. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Well, it, and it has made me rethink prepping. Um, I recall my wife and I bought a couple of uh, bug out bags uh, a while back and I thought, "Mm, I'm going to have to, let me go check on those, make sure they're still in good shape. And maybe I should start doing some more dehydrating of food for jerky. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. You can survive on very little, you know, sure. but, and then there's the whole thing of what happens when the kids grow, right. the, the clothes that fit them. I mean, depending on what age they are, but if they're 12, 13 years old, the clothes they fit them now aren't going to fit in six months and certainly not in a year. So now what right. do you do? Right. The question is, as as is often the case, especially with this book, and faces us today, what will we do when the proverbial shit hits the fan? And um, I'm going to save a, a little bit of that for later because it's going to pop up in rapid fire questions. But this this Victoria Emerson, what I liked about her, first first of all, she's just a strong woman who says, no, you know, there's got to, like, back to your previous point, somebody's got to lead this group. Uh, I'm going to do it. And anybody think they can do it better? Step on up. And so I like that attitude, and she really does not pull any punches. She's a gal I admire. I think our readers will admire. Um, that is, if you ha- I have not read Crimson Phoenix, by the way. So that that launched her career, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, that, that was the first book in the series. And uh, this is a question I was going to ask later, but it's popping into my mind now. So uh, I'm assuming it's pretty... There, I'm not going to say it's a cliffhanger, but this story certainly goes, come on, let's tell me more. I'm sorry. Nice. How far are you into that right now? Well, the, the third book is going to be called White Smoke, and I believe a, I'm 2,600 words into it. <laughs> so out of 100,000. So we, it, I got a ways to go. I deliver it in June, and it comes out next February. Okay, so 2,600. You're going to... A hundred in June. Yes. That you gotta you gotta hustle. Yeah. What are you, my editor? <laughs> <laughs> my wife? Come on. <laughs> I can do it. Really, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh and why so few words, John? There. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a um it's been an interesting few weeks here, not to get into the personal stuff. We got really, really slammed by COVID in my family. And all the vaccines, all that kind of stuff, we still got hit real hard. So I lost February, or excuse me, I lost uh, December to, uh, and we did it in order. I started it, then my wife got it, and then my son got it. So, you know, you do the whole, the whole thing. But, you know, it's uh, my writing process. I hate that word. I mean, it's so pretentious, but I'm a panic writer. Um, I can, if I had a year and a half to write this thing, I would still take the last two months and three months to, to, to run it out. So it's just my nature. I like that. So we have, we have, we have a pantser. Oh yeah. Plotter. And we have panicker. 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 All right. Oh shit. I got to finish this book. (laughs) (laughs) People are actually waiting for it. You know what though? I actually really like and embrace that because there is something about, now it's going to sound a little bit professional, unprofessional out of this side of my mouth, but very uh, purposeful out of this side of the mouth. But there's something I really like about pressure. And I, and there's a, there's a theory, God, why would I say this and then not have the name of the theory that says, if you're given one hour or one week, 
uh, you know, if you're given one week, you're likely not going to do it. But if you're given one hour, you'll do the amount of work and probably even better because you're forced into a funnel. Well, it, 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 if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. Is, is, is the same cliche, I think. And, and I, for me, there's a lot of truth in it. For years, I wrote probably, that's, I've done 24 books, so probably the, at least 10 or 12 of them were written when I had a full-time job that required me to travel all the time. And I still owed a book a year. So um, now I write full time and, and I'm still panicking at the very end to get it all done. So um, isn't that funny? Isn't that isn't that a isn't that a funny little thing about us? 24 books. Now you got it all. You've got all the time in the world. Yeah, right. <laughs> all the time. It's such a luxurious year, too. There's no pressure whatsoever. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So now I'm doing two books a year. So. I do jumping back and I love this inside stuff jumping back to the story and it's is it a silly question how has it changed your perspective on being prepared you know the old boy scout moniker well I have I've always kind of leaned that way um I was a, I was a firefighter at EMT for 15 years back in the day and you know you see a lot of stuff and, and you realize that things can change on a on a dime um, we are actually in the process of building a, a house. It'll be ready next month, actually, um, out in the boonies. Not because of the book per se, but to have my space. I'm, I'm in a, right now, as I speak, I'm in a suburb of Washington, D.C. Okay. And it's just everybody is too close. Nobody, everybody is dependent on the grocery store. Everybody, and that's not, that's, I mean, it is me because of where I live, but it's not what I have to be. So I, I do want to move out and I'll have a garden. I, I find fresh vegetables are really hard to get anymore. You know, tomatoes that taste like tomatoes. True. Um, so I don't know if writing the book changed me, but I know it, my, my real life thoughts certainly influence the going about the, you know, how, how the book works. Um, you know, there's the difference between, uh, I mean, nobody's going to care if you speed. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to need a building permit. You know, there's a, there's a lot of infrastructure that is that drives how we think about things. Um, the concept of justice versus fairness. You know, what's there's everything changed when you take when you take out the 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 fence posts of society as we know it yep um things just matter differently yeah and and that came to light really well when all of a sudden this guy rolls up uh, in a boat on the shore and approaches victoria and says drop down your guns i'm the army we're taking over and i'm like there's there's no established regiment of uh, authority anymore so kind of off and be on your way and, right. and, and it didn't hit me until then. Yeah, that's right. All rules are out the window. So you got to start from ground zero. Yeah. I mean, we agree as a society that a green piece of paper with a one on it is worth one fifth of what a green piece of paper with a five on it is. Okay. What are you going to buy in that situation? So right. now it, 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 by definition, restart, resets to a barter, right? But not yes. everybody is prepared to do that. What, is it, what does a career banker do? when all of a sudden banking doesn't, doesn't matter. Do they have the skills? And, and what is society going to do to support the people who don't? Right. And uh, so it's it really, it's been creating this little microcosm of, of society and then playing with it has been really a lot of fun. And that has also been an eye opener for me. Oh yeah. I shared this as I was reading, I would run down the hall and talk to my wife and I'm like, oh, wait, babe, listen to this. We're going to be bartering one day. We got to really master our bartering. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, think about this. You know, money doesn't mean anything anymore. So what's the one thing that will help you? Food and probably ammunition to protect your family. And I'm like, so John's doing this thing where you're like trading. Uh, I'll give you five twenty-two bullets in exchange for, you know, that beef jerky. And I thought, how interesting and how a poignant it instantly kicked in. Uh, of course, it is in fiction, but I saw it instantly happening to us. You would go, okay, well, what are the things you really, really, really got to have? And you, it becomes an instant value, and everybody becomes, you know, vendors and barterers. 
Yeah, and if you decide after you buy your jerky for five bullets, right, you then make it, you know, do a little chopped episode for yourself, right? You turn the, the beef jerky and combine it with the eggs that you bought from somebody else, and then you and you bake a thing, and then you right. sell the thing to somebody else who then gives you more. I mean, it's that's kind of how the the whole capitalist system works ultimately. I was but but you just have to reset your mind of, yeah. of what's important. It yeah. ain't going to be the paper dollar. No, I love it because that's one of the things that uh, Victoria s- said uh, out of the gate was, um, welcome to capitalism, guys, at its finest. Uh, I know, you know, we're, we're, of course, talking about Blue Fire and, and the Victoria Emerson thriller series, but I, I want to step back because I, and I apologize, I'm a little bit embarrassed uh, to admit this, but I was not aware of your Jonathan Graves series. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I went back and I saw that you've written one of those bad boys every year since 2009, uh, I went, uh, okay, yeah, if you don't understand the definition of chops, there's one of them. That's no easy feat. Let's talk about, can we talk about Jonathan Graves sure, for a second? Absolutely. Well, two-part question, and it makes me think of my friend uh, K.J. Howe and her Skyjack and Freedom Broker books. Uh, mm-hmm. Why a freelance specialist in covert rescue? So basically in standard English hostage rescue series. Where did you come up with that idea? Well, I mean, the original was I, I did one nonfiction book back in 2006 called Six Minutes to Freedom, and it was about a very successful Delta Force operation. And as it turns out at the time, at least I was told that at the time, that was the only book that that Delta, which doesn't officially exist, but the participants were allowed, were cleared to work with me and and report on this mission, in part because Kurt Muse is a co-author and Kurt Muse is the guy who was rescued. So um, but anyway, th- this this got me into this. Um, this hostage rescue space. And I was talking with a buddy of mine who's in the FBI and um, there is a fundamental difference between the way hostage rescue is done on the American shore versus how it's done overseas. If you are um, taken by bad guys in, in a foreign land, um, the American intelligence community starts working on your rescue plan. And depending on where you are, if it's a friendly nation, then the assets there will likely handle the rescue. If it's not so friendly, then it'll be our guys. It'll be either SEALs or, or Delta or others. And But the mission in that case is rescuing the hostage. That's it. And everything else is secondary to it. So if you can pick up intel and all that, that's great. In the United States, when there's a hostage rescue situation, the mission is to make sure that the bad guy doesn't get away. You wanna make sure that the bad guy, you, you, you uh, cross all the T's and dot all the I's and get the warrants and all that to in, in line because the mission is to arrest the bad guy. And of course they wanna rescue the, the, the good guys too, right? Sure. But I know one very good friend of mine who's, who's involved with this stuff, um, they consider a hostage taking to be a homicide in slow motion, which is what his words, not mine. Wow. So in my mind, I thought that, you know, that's a fundamental difference. So if you have a guy like Jonathan Gray, who's a former Delta operator, who um, you, you want him to go get your loved one, he, he doesn't go to a courthouse. He doesn't deal with a judge. He does his own intel. He, does, he has his own assets. And he goes and he and he brings back the good guys from the bad guys. So that's where it comes from. Awesome. I find it interesting how many of us guys, probably probably gals too, but guys particularly, loves to start off their writing career. I did it. You did it. So many have done it with the renegade loner who does it his way and has a special talent that maybe not everyone has. And he plays by his own rules. And I guess it goes, well, it goes back way further than Western, but uh, my mind goes right to Western, you know, do you, you, the guy, you know, <laughs> go on, go on. Uh, he may not have a name. I don't know, but he's, he may be good, bad, or ugly or all three, but he's out there marching by his own drum. Well, I think, you know, it, it's the idea of playing the hero, you know? I mean, it's just, everybody wants to do that. And then, I, and I hasten to add, Jonathan is not alone. Jonathan has a, has a team that he works with that happened very good. And um, 
in some cases lethal, in some cases funny. It, it's uh, uh, it's been I think I just signed signed a contract for number fifteen and sixteen in that series. Oh, dang! Good for you, dude. Congratulations! Yeah. High five right here, yeah. right? Bam! And that's great. Great segue to my next question is f- fifteen and sixteen. So, do you see how how far do you see uh, our friend going? Uh, first, Jonathan, and then Victoria. But I want to really. Th- think about him because now that I've found out you've written so many on this one cat, I, I got to go back and start reading some. Of I built the Jonathan series to be a series, which is the, I had not done that in my previous books. Okay. So Jonathan is wealthy because his dad was a career criminal and um, he's the benefactor for a place called Resurrection House, which is the home residential school for the children of incarcerated parents. And he lives in this little town. He's got the, you know, the, the special skills and, and intel and all of that. So there are, there are very few storylines that I couldn't hang on the Jonathan model. And I, and I built that intentionally. Some of it's international, some of it's domestic, some of, you know, it, whatever, whatever hits me at the, at, at the time. So Jonathan can run for a long time. Victoria, I, in my head, it's a trilogy. Um, there's a lot more that can go on in, in her world. You, you've read to the end of Blue Fire, so you know that there are a couple of things that, that need to be uh, need to be shut shut down. Thus, the name White Smoke for the third book, and um, and after that, I don't know if there's if there's a, a market for it. Then sure, I, I would do it. There's something um, I don't I don't want to state state this wrong. I was going to say it's it's not as pleasant a series to write but that's not true because I, I love what I do but it Victoria will sometimes take me to places that that you know I I go there because I have to go there and I think I pull it off well in the book and part of the reasons I think I can pull it off well is I don't particularly enjoy being there but um it, you know it's so we'll see I, I don't know the the, the major storylines in in White Smoke when it comes out next year um will all sort of be closed down. And after that, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to continue the stories in that world, but the current arc is a three book arc in my mind. John, I want you to lie back and relax on the couch. This is therapy time. This is your time. <laughs> so we're going to work this out. Breathe deeply. Um, <laughs> Where's my martini? <laughs> Well, I'm excited about uh, the Graves series, and I, I'm looking forward to dipping into that. And congratulations again to Thank hitting. You. The, I mean, uh, I, and as you were talking about Victoria, I said, uh, you know, well, uh, will there be a fourth? Well, let's see what Kensington Books and Company fill in the blank uh, have to say about that. I mean, you know, I could be very interested. John says the two books a year. I'll be honest with you, is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Well. And let's, can we break that down a little bit? Because we have so many readers or listeners, watchers that are, you know, not everybody's up in that uh, echelon where you are. Some of us are uh, self-published cats. And can we dissect that for a second? Because two books a year at a hundred thousand, your goal is a hundred thousand, right, John? Right. So doing a couple of hundred thousand word books, especially in two different universes, when you consider your research, well, your idea, your, your meditating, which, you know, uh, let's not shortchange the time it takes to just really marinate. I'm a big fan of taking the time to let that soup and barbecue ribs marinate before you eat it. Mm-hmm. So you got that, then you got the writing, then you got the drafting or drafting, then you got the writing, then you got the rewriting, then you may or may not have another rewrite, then you got it, the editor, and then those notes, and and you got to hit a date somewhere for the release. So, I mean, can you work out a little bit of your process? I'd be really- Sure. I mean, it, you eat an elephant a bite at a time, right? So yeah. I, I try not to think about the magnitude of, of what lies ahead. I get myself into a headspace of writing the scene that I'm in. And while I'm not an outliner, I know, I know what the end of the book is going to be before I start. So I, I know where I'm, I'm, I'm writing to. And then it's a matter of getting into the scenes and, and playing with your imaginary friends. You know, when you, you get in the zone, you're a writer. So, you know, when you're in the zone, it's, it's just 
It's just there. The reality of, of the typewriter and the computer is, is far less real than the imagined reality of, of what it is you're doing. It's called psychosis if you don't get paid for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, and as far as the, the mechanical process, I am, I either do one draft or I do 30. It, it depends. I start every, every writing session, I start by rewriting what I wrote yesterday. So by the time I actually get to the last chapter, there's, it's pretty much polished. Yeah. So when I, when I click send and it's, it's pretty clean yeah. um, for, uh, for blue, for, nope, for, give me a second. I know this one. Um, Lethal Game is the next Jonathan Grave book. And I did one of these mad minute, uh, I think I wrote 40,000 words in 20 days. And uh, it is some of the, a lot of typos. But in terms of the prose itself and presentation of action and Christmas of dialogue and all of that, it is some of the cleanest stuff I've ever written. And, and I, don't, I don't know why. Can um, I interrupt it, you a second? I want to go back because I was jotting a note. I'm sorry. I was trying to pay attention. I was jotting down a name, Le Lethal Game. How many words and how fast? 40,000 words in about 20 days. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but by then, you know, it, it really is, that it's about narrating the scenes. It's putting, it, it's all sure. there in my head. Sure. The hardest part for me is the beginning of a book where I'm trying to figure out, well, what needs to go where you're putting the jigsaw puzzle together. Nope. That scene has to move from here to back there because it needs to set up a thing. And yeah. Oh, oh, oh there's mechanics, the, the choreography. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, is what takes time in the beginning. And then at the end, it's just a matter of, you know, how long can you sit in the seat? You know, yeah. my focal length will be like this far. <laughs> By the time I'm done, I can't see anything out there because I've just been staring into a light bulb all day. Right. I, I'm with you. I, I'm a big fan of, I write. And when I'm done, I walk away and come back the next day and I rewrite and or polish what I did yesterday. And I feel, I feel good about that moving forward. A lot of people will... There are certain mindsets that'll tell you mm, that's not a good idea because you're constantly tweaking. So what happens when you get 12, 22, 39 chapters in and something changes or you've come up with a new idea? Do you have to go back? But I'm a, I, I'm just I'm kind of with you. I'm like, it, it, it just feels right that way because I always feel purposeful and finished each day that I go forward. And I feel, oh, I feel really good about that. I don't have that looming thing over my head of, oh, I've got to go back and like completely rework all of this. Too daunting. Well, I will. There's two ways that I approach that. <clears throat> if it is a change that has to be made, if I get to chapter 20 and I realize I got to change something in chapter 14 to make chapter 20 work, I will go back and fix it then. I hate building an unstable foundation. Yeah. So you know, it's former engineer. So if I, I will go back and, and, and make the earlier parts better. The other approach depends on where I am relative to the deadline. If I think I've written myself into a corner, especially in the Grave series, um, okay, you're a big hero, fight your way out of it, figure out a way, make the characters fix it so that I don't have to go back and rewrite it with time I don't have. <laughs> and oddly enough, I think, you know, there's a subconscious element to all of this. It's there. You just have to, you have to find it. And for me, those are the, those are the high five days. You know, you go, wow, I actually, it, that actually worked. Yeah. Folks, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, John's got a story that's going to have you right on the edge of your seat. It's something I read about and something tells me with his telling it, it's going to be way better. It's good. Stay with us right here on The Thriller Zone. Can you give me your, in your words, because I read, I mean, I could go dig it on your website right now, but I'm not going to take the time away from it. There is a story you tell about the first time you had snagged your movie deal. You and your wife were out to dinner and agent calls and says, hey, uh, stay near your phone. We've yeah. got a, we got a deal brewing. Can you tell me? I, my palms were sweating. I love that story. I was, it actually, it, it transpired over, I'm East Coast and, okay. you know, and the agents are all on the West Coast, except my literary agent who called me from New York and it was a Friday night and, or Friday afternoon. 
and she entered, I had just sold the, the publishing rights to Nathan's Run for an obscene amount of money two days before. That was my first book. And so she called and she said, "How?" when I answered the phone at work, um, how does it feel to be the most talked about author in New York? Which, which is, it feels really good. It doesn't last long, but it feels really good. Yeah. And so we chatted a bit and, and we, there were a lot of foreign sales that were happening. And she said, so what are your plans for tonight? And I said, well, it's Friday night. It's pizza and movie night. And she said, funny, you should mention movies. Um, we got seven studios bidding on the, uh, on the movie rights. Uh, we think it'll close tonight. Can you, can you stay by your phone? Well, no, I'm sorry. Pizza and movie night. Absolutely not. Of course I can stay by my phone. So I go home and I don't know, it, seven o'clock, which would be four o'clock at all time. Um, I answer the phone and there's this guy who says, hi, I'm, I'm Matthew Snyder. I'm your film agent. And I said, oh, okay. How did I get you? And then it's through the literary agent. So it ultimately ended up um, about 10 o'clock our time. Uh, it was Disney, Fox and Warner Brothers were uh, in the, the final bidding war. And uh, so Matt called and, and he said, I have, Disney has an offer for stupid money. Right. And I said, okay. And he said, it's only good for 10 minutes. I said, okay. Did we say yes? He said, no, because I haven't heard back from Warner Brothers yet. And I said, well, how serious is the 10 minutes? And he said, well, it's eight minutes now. <laughs> and so he and my, my, my literary agent at the time were chatting back and forth. It's a conference call, which in 1994, five was kind of a big deal yeah and um every minute on the minute disney would take matt away so tell your client there's exactly four minutes left in in this deal in three minutes and all and i finally and they're just chatting i said guys stop take it i can't i yeah this is not i like poker but not at the at these stakes yeah and then matthew says wait i got warners on the line so he comes off and he, and he said well okay now it's like 10 30 or whatever that was the time. Yeah. And uh, he said, Warner Brothers matched Disney's offer. So I know it's late over there. I'd like to just bounce them off each other and take the highest one if that's okay with you. Yeah. So why the hell wouldn't it be okay with me? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I thought perhaps you have preference for producers. What the hell's a producer? Why would I? No. <laughs> no, yeah, take the biggest number. So that was, that was the first movie deal. <laughs> Oh, oh by the way, the movie was never made. It got caught in turnaround, right? It did. Yeah. Did. Turnaround for uh, folks who don't know, that's the dark abyss that so many projects end up falling into. That turnaround means basically it's put on the shelf until somebody attaches or someone has attached and they're unattaching or they have a reattachment and uh, or problems with the star or nah, the script doesn't work well and, and in this case what happened they ended up they they paid me a f good chunk and then they hire a screenwriter and they didn't like the first screenplay so they hired another screenwriter and and i think he made it worse than the first one which was awful and you know by the time and all of that gets stacked onto what it would cost somebody else if they wanted to make the movie of Nathan's Run, sure, we'd love to give it to you. It, it, but it's understand it's like two million bucks before you can even start casting, right? right? So it's it's Hollywood. Yeah, but let me interrupt. Didn't you? Didn't you take a stab at? I writing? did. Yeah, I did. I the first screenplay was so awful, and Matthew called and said that you know I got bad news. It's going to turn around. Was a term I had never heard. And I said, well, they don't like the script because the script is awful. <laughs> and I said, I could write a better script and I've never seen a script. And he said, can you do it by next Wednesday? And, and I, you know, I, my theory in life is if you're going to be a dog, be a big dog. And I said, absolutely. And I hung up and I said, oh shit, I, I don't, I don't know what a screenplay looks like. So I went and I bought William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade which has the whole script of um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in the back, which is an old school script. But I just, I, I got the format and I understood there's a narrative storytelling in script writing that is not that different than the narrative storytelling. It's shorter, it's more, it's more abrupt, but it's yeah. kind of in the same theme. So, so I did, I, I wrote the screenplay and I've got it out of turnaround for a very short period of time. And then now it is where it is.
And so they got the, a writing sample. <laughs> so the good news is you got a shit ton of money. You got a great experience. You got a chance to learn and deliver a screenplay, which is a whole nother uh, yeah. tool in your toolbox. And there is the outside chance that Hollywood may one day when a new producer comes along and has gotten bored with every other thing that's gotten rehashed after it was rehashed and they find a shiny new toy and they polish it and go, let's make this one go. And you'll PS, you'll get paid again. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah, the, the back end money still hasn't been paid. So you know, it, and this was back in the '90s when screen, you know, the, that stuff was going for mega bucks. So okay, I'm gonna say it right now. I wish I were you. Okay, <laughs> dude, you're living the dream. So, but you got the hair. But you gotta you gotta fuss with it all the time. Yeah, well, there's that. Great problem to have, right? So, uh, John, as I was stalking you on social media, and I say that term loosely, I see that you're super inquisitive guy. I mean, like, it, it's clear that if you, you're not afraid to research, and if you want to know about a gun, you go research the gun. You want to know how that gun shoots, you go shoot the gun. I saw a lot of sh gun shooting. You, you want to know about historical locations, you travel to them. Has that always been kind of your method, and do you... I get a sense that you really embrace that. Well, I think I, I, I research what, it, what really interests me and all the things that you mentioned are on that list. And, um, you know, historical places, I don't write about places per se. I write about the feel of a place. Right. And, uh, and to me, that's much more important. My wife and I used to travel uh, every year, September 15th is, is the historical deadline for the Jonathan Grave books, and our wedding anniversary is September 29th. So we would use the, the, the drop dead date for the manuscript as a time to go travel overseas. And, and we would travel, we'd spend two weeks in Paris, spent two weeks in Lisbon, and we want to rent an apartment and just kind of feel the neighborhood. And we're not that big on museums and such. But to kind of to the degree that you can become part of, of a community in, in a couple of weeks, right? Um, it's I en I enjoy that and I enjoy the feel of it. Uh, every year, I should be there now. Actually, there's a thing called the Shot Show, which is for weapon systems. What um, the Detroit Auto Show is for cars. It's in Vegas, and just because of stuff, I'm not able to be there. But sure. uh, but they have. You, know, you can go shoot anything you want. I've shot grenade launchers. I've shot crossbows. I've done, um, and I'm kind of a gun guy anyway. I've, yeah. I've, always, I've always enjoyed that. So yeah, I mean, the, the research doesn't feel like research. The real research feels like playing and, and then you, I, it happens to serve the books. In, in Blue Fire, it, the, the, um, the annex, the Hilltop Resort is actually based on a real place at the Greenbrier in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, which was the government relocation center back you know, before the Washington Post revealed the secret. Um, so I've been down there and I've toured it and I've, I've seen, you know, once you, once you get an image in your head, I don't want to create it as a photograph in words, but I get a feel for it. And yeah. once I have a feel for it, then I can bring it to life. Uh, my dad got to go there for a conference once. So when I read that in the book, I instantly ran back to that in my mind and thought he loved it. It was such a great experience. And it, it, your story revealed something I didn't know about, which was the hidden spot. But yeah, if that becomes public, it kind of uh, shoots the purpose of that, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, it was also a bit of the time. It was Eisenhower administration started it and <clears throat> the nukes were going to be delivered by bomber and they took a while. You know, now they're, flight times are eight minutes or less from submarines off the coast. So yeah, that's mind boggling. One other thing before we kind of begin to wrap things up, I was visiting your YouTube channel and man, uh, folks, uh, in case you want to know, this is a terrific resource for up and coming writers. I mean, I found myself traveling down the proverbial rabbit hole because, uh, you know, y your videos are engaged. It's just you sitting there at your desk and it, but you're teaching us stuff or, or you're on location t having spoken. But I'm like, I found myself going, Oh, I I'm getting a kind of a free lesson from a guy who really knows what he's talking about. I mean, tell us about your passion to pass along that vast knowledge and experience. Well, I, you know, it's writing is a lonely endeavor. And there is a lot 
of shitty advice that's out there. It's delivered by people who have listened to people who gave them the shitty advice. And I don't know if, you know, my way is my way. I've never taken a writing class. You know, I'm actually, I'm completely self-taught through all of this, which is, I think the best way and maybe the hardest way yeah. to go about it. So I wanted to present the reality of the business as well as some issues of creativity, but it's really more on a business side of things um, from somebody who has been there for 25 years. And, and what, I, what I present, whether it's, you know, how is a movie deal structured? How do authors get paid? Um, I've interviewed my editor and my agent for one of them about industry stuff. So what I present is 100% accurate as it happened to me, whether it's somebody else's experience or not, I, I don't know. But I, you know, I think that sharing is important. People shouldn't feel all alone. I also think that not everybody, um, you know, I would, I could hit golf balls eight hours a day, all day for 20 years, and I would never be a professional golfer. I just don't have it. Right. You know, I don't. And and I think there are a thousand different reasons for people to write. But I also think people are curious about a pretty cool industry and, and I try to give them the inside, uh, inside scoop. I haven't done one in, in far too long, actually, but they're fun. Well, I have to applaud you because they really are, you know, and they're not terribly long. So that's kind of the thing with me and my attention span, plus the volume of books I'm trying to read on any given week to do the show. But what I loved about it was you gave me an inside sense of what's going on without being laborious as a teacher. Here's what I'll be in and pontificating on structure and so forth, which is all great and good. And there are a lot of great books out there to read, which you can do on your own. But you kind of cut to the chase on so many things. And I, I'm going to plug your YouTube channel a little bit later. But um, it's, folks, it's just a great primer on knowing how the business works from a guy who, as you can see and hear, knows what the hell he's talking about. I, I try. Yeah, well, nicely done. I do want to say, before we get to rapid fire questions, what do you think, if you could boil it down, John, and we've gotten to know each other well enough that I know you can shoot it straight to me in a very concise form that our listeners can really appreciate. What do you think? If you, It could be one or two points, I don't know. But what's your secret to success? What's that one thing that goes, okay, this, if I was going to speak to a group of people, this is what it would be? I, I think that's, that's easy. And um, there are... There are so many naysayers, but particularly if if you take arts or athletics or um, you know singing, dancing, acting, writing uh, seriously as as an endeavor that, that you want to pursue, there are all kinds of people who are going to laugh at you, and there's all kinds of people who are going to tell you it's a bad idea. There are people who are will look at what is a perfectly acceptable a bit of writing and they'll tear it apart because it's a prologue or because it starts with the weather or, you know, some of these stupid rules that aren't <laughs> really rules at all. And, um, and, and I think that anybody who's, who's in this space, in the writing space or the accuracy singing or stuff that I don't do, um, you have to be true to yourself. You know, I, I write, what I write is exactly what I want it to be. And, you know, I'm fortunate that there's a big reader base out there and so the, the putting this into a bit of advice, just because someone says you're done or you're not good, you're in the game until you quit. You know, it's, it's um, every career, there are ups and downs. You, you, it's no, no successful journey, including my own, is a straight line trajectory. I mean, there's some yeah. really bad parts that are in there. Yeah. And... Um, at one point, actually, it was an early Thriller Fest. One of my friends came up and said, I'm so sorry to hear about your career. I said, what happened to my career? And I written, I reached a rough spot. I don't want to go into all that. But I wasn't done. I mean, the industry, I guess, thought I was done. And some people thought I was done. And I fired my agent and I, and, and I moved on. But I came back. So is failure cannot be inflicted. Failure can only be declared. And... And that's the takeaway that I want people to get. That is so succinct and strong. And thank you for that. That's good. I so resonate with your attitude. Um, 
and your uh, the premise on, upon which you have built your career. I, I so I so applaud you because you're saying that thing that resonates with my spirit, which is go your own path, do it your way. If it works, great. If it doesn't, who cares? Mm-hmm. Twist it until it does work or until you decide that, that isn't what you want to do anymore. That's kind of the way I look at it. And if it stops being fun, you're not going to be good at it. Yeah. P.S. If it's not fun, get out. Yeah. Okay. Are you familiar with our little uh, thing called rapid fire questions? I'm not, but I bet I'm going to get an introduction here. Okay. Well, here it comes. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lobby a couple of softballs first. Okay. Real easy. Pen and paper or keyboard? Yes. Both. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. I probably hand write maybe 25% of, okay. of every book. Okay. Uh, tranquil silence or busy coffee shop? Busy coffee shop. Ditto. Okay, now it gets more complicated. You and your wife have just experienced the balloon rise or AKA shit hits the fan. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that you're glad you've already done in real life to prepare you and your wife for this aforementioned shitting of the fan, hitting of the fan? Having a very well-prepared place to go in West Virginia. And it is West Virginia where you're building the house? Yeah, yeah. I side note, I got to take a detour. Why is it that so many of these gigs, uh, these books are about the Virginia, West Virginia, Appalachia area, which is where I'm from? I mean, why there? <clears throat> because it's not, um, I mean, the reality, again, my knowledge is old. It's not a targeted area. It's, it's wooded. It's got a lot of natural resources. It's got a lot of game. It's got, I put it there because I, I love it there. I'm going to be living there. And it's, and it's what I know. Yeah. But if you start going out into the Western states, Montana yep. is one big nuclear crater when things go on, but just because of the stuff that's out there, right? Everything's going to be targeted. So that's why I put it. There. Okay, fair enough. Um, what is the, what's the very first and second thing that you will do the moment you realize of the situation? So big flash, boom, uh, first and second thing you're going to do. Um, take shelter mm -hmm. and hang out for a couple of days and then go out and assess what's going on and go about surviving. You, excellent answer. You made me think of something. Uh, and it, what was the phrase you used? It had to do with uh, the uh, the animals had been hunted out. What's the right. phrase? Yeah. Right. That's a scary premise. Now I got to think to yourself, if you get deep enough in some of those woods, that situation, that's a hard thing to actually imagine happening. But if you have a mass exodus to one location and everyone is armed, then I could see that happening. Well, and what happens in, in my mind in the, thank God we haven't had to do this. Right. Right. But it, it would take the, the survivors from where I live now, to walk out to where I will be living in a, in a month, it's probably a two week walk, maybe not quite that that far. Yeah, um, everybody's going to go west because it wouldn't make no sense to go elsewhere from here. Right. And then you have the Great Lakes folks who are going to be coming south and east. So you're going to have that strip that's going to be suddenly populated by a lot of people who are totally helpless, helpless, and desperate. Yeah. And and that's that and again go bring it back to the to the novel if you can organize that if you can somehow prevent the panic by telling people okay yes you'll you'll we will teach you how to fend for yourself um but you have an obligation back to the community i like the fact that you're uh, expecting you're hope you're hopeful that society will not lose their shit when aforementioned shit hits the aforementioned fan <laughs> You made me think of something. It was 1994, the Northridge earthquake uh, hit Los Angeles. I am less than two miles from the epicenter. So my building uh, experienced the shit hitting the fan. That next hour to three hours was nothing like I'd ever experienced before. When you start seeing people donning nine millimeters and M16s over their shoulder and breaking through 7-Elevens for a pack of cigarettes, a gallon of milk, and toilet paper, you know that the world has gone awry. And 
while I was reading this book, I was revisiting that thought. And I thought, because we're just animals by nature, right? The monkey mind kicks in and you're like, ah, I don't have any more toilet paper or milk ah, or bread, but I'm gluten free. So I don't even need it anyway. Anyway, so just, <laughs> and, and you just say to yourself, Jesus, you know, if you've done a little bit of planning, maybe just a little bit, a modicum of planning, then you might not be in that situation, but boy, uh, I always know where exits are. Yeah. Um, I am never in a place where I don't know where exits are. And I will sometimes plot out the most obvious exit is not the one I would use in most cases, unless it's right next to me. But where everybody else is going to be log jamming, I'm going to go someplace else. And um, one of the things that comes up in the Victoria books is what I call the concentric, concentric circle theory. And that is true of, of my life. You know, there's, there's my family, there's my, my wife and my son and I, he's 35 years old. And yes, we do have a rallying spot where if the shit hits the fan that we will go. Yeah. And, um, and everything else, the, 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 the center of the circle is what you would kill to protect and you would die to protect. That's yes. it. It's a very small circle. Yeah. And then as it grows, you know, it's, it's, you get close friends and family and neighbors and, and, but as soon as an inner circle is threatened, none of them matter. I mean, that's kind of the survival mindset, I think. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't mean you go blasting people away, but no. I, I think being, being prepared is, is all about being prepared when panicked people are feral. They, they just are, you know, you see it, you hear it all the time. Lifeguards tell stories of people they're rescuing, trying to drown them, you know, push them underwater and, and that sort of thing. Panic is, panic is a bad thing. And the, and the solution to panic is to be prepared and to have a plan and knowing that the plan by definition is flawed. Yeah, man, we could call on our good friend, Jack Carr about now, cause he's, uh, uh, if he's not a full on prepper, he certainly has done enough homework. Okay. One more question, then we're done. All right. Well, it's been fun. Yeah, still remaining in the mindset of the scenario of Blue Fire and Company. Because it's so visceral, you and your wife luckily have canned and smoked and dried plenty of food, right? And you have two guests. <laughs> this is going to, it's, it's <laughs> absurd. Two guests are coming over for dinner for a beautiful spread that uh, you, not many people are left around, by the way. Uh, and since you get to invite two dream guests, P.S., they can be alive or dead, who would they be? and why. And let's take out the emergency of it. I just set all that up because we've been talking about this topic mm -hmm. all day, but you can make it more pleasant by going, yeah, we're going to move into our brand new home in West Virginia and uh, Honey Bun and I get to invite a couple of friends over. Okay. I, I dare you to call my wife Honey Bun just once. I want to see it. I want to be there. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to, yeah. Okay. Um, so who would I invite? But this isn't to, to help me survive. This is who would no. I want to sit down and I was mixing metaphors, if right, you will. Okay. Uh, let's take it out and just say, hey, you've moved into your brand new house and you could invite two people to join you for dinner. And it's a fabulous dinner and they can be alive or in the past. And Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And why? I think that would be a fascinating because they started it all. Yeah. You know, it was, it was their dream that established what we have in, in America now. Plus, Franklin's a real, he's a drinker. So, you know, we could <laughs> There's stay that. up into the wee hours with him and his gout. Oh, my goodness. We have some cocktails in our future, Mr. Gilstrap. I'll tell you that. <clears throat> um, if you want to learn more about John Gilstrap, grab a pen and paper because this is going to be really tough. Go to johngilstrap.com. Uh, YouTube is author John Gilstrap. Facebook is John Gilstrap author. And Twitter is John. I all that well, did I? Uh, it's okay. We all do that because as we're trying to dial up our uh, significant monikers, we go, oh, is it author or author at the end or writer or. And then John Gilstrap 201 is Twitter. What's 201? Uh, I don't know. Somehow I lost my Twitter handle. It used to be at John Gilstrap. And so I had to rebuild and I tried. Real John Gilstrap is too many letters. Um, so, okay, yeah. fine. 201. Yeah. Well, and I'll be honest with you, of all the social media that's out there, I slam Facebook pretty hard. I don't get Twitter. I can't. It's just too fast. Too much stuff flying by. I just, I can't keep up. 
I'm glad you said that because I noticed you only had like what 108 followers or something. But I go on mm -hmm. this this cat it has a way bigger audience than that. I know that. Well, I had 26,000 until I lost the Twitter handle. <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, yeah, it, the thing about Twitter is it's really kind of more news and current events, I suppose. Uh, I think I've become guilty of what so many writers have become guilty of, and I'm making a confession here, Father, forgive me for uh, <laughs> is that we we use it for a lot of promotion. You know, I want, I'm, I'm going to pimp my show, The Thriller Zone. I'm going to pimp John Gilstrap coming up on the show. And is that such a bad thing, though? No, I, but to me, it makes Twitter irrelevant. I, I yeah. much rather, Facebook has its, has its troubles too, but I can engage in long form. I haven't given you a short answer to a single question during this whole interview, right? Because no. I, don't, I don't think in Twitterese. I yeah. think in long form. I'm a novelist. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's a really good point. And the only reason I think I excel is because I force myself... I dabbled in screenplays for a while before I started writing novels. So the good news is I was able to consolidate a story into 120 pages versus 500. The bad news is you, if you do that too much too soon, you start to write in screenplay ease. And, uh, but here's the real point is that if you do want to get out a message quickly and you've got a certain amount of followers, I think that's healthy. But here's my biggest point, and I think this is probably somewhere in your psychology that you would agree with because we seem to hit it off on so many cylinders, is that I am finding myself now more and more wanting to really, I'm so, uh, what's the word, jealous of time. Maybe it's because I'm closer to the end than the beginning. But I want to spend that time writing. If I'm not spending it with my wife or my friends or family, uh, I, I really want to be being, you know, committed to that writing. And, you know, I can sit there in social media until my head falls off. But does that make sense? Well, yeah, it does. And I think that more and more these days, you know, phraseology, particularly on Twitter, how you, how you say something, everything seems to get... Um, examine so closely and yeah. and i don't i don't have i don't have time to roll my eyes at stuff you know life's too short yeah. and um so i don't do as much social media as i should either but it's it is what it is yeah. and you know the, the best way to sell books is to write more books wait a minute sound bite attention please <laughs> attention on l7 we have a sound bite yeah, that is the, you know, and by the way, our success comes from people discovering our art form that we are enjoying creating. And, you know, what's the old saying in Hollywood? I know you've heard this. So what else you got? John Gilstrap, thank you so much for the gift of your time. Oh, it's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. This has been, I mean, I feel like... Uh, I don't say this to everybody. I feel like we we're pals and we've been, we've known each other forever. It's crazy. Do you get it's, that sense? It, it's the gin we didn't have. It's the gin <laughs> we didn't have. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, it's, first of all, you're really good at what you do. And um, there are, I do a lot of this stuff and there are interviewers who have their list of questions and, and I could say, and then when I witnessed the Kennedy assassination, such and such happened and, but they would be on to the next question. You know, not do the follow up of, of stuff. So yeah. I, it's so much more fun when it's a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I'm disappointed is that we couldn't sit down at the same table with drink in hand and have this like right next to each other. Cause that's, well, there's a, there's a long time ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That day's coming, right? Please say right. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hope so. I hope so. John, thank you again. We'll be uh, talking again down the road. Oh, and by the way, when you're on Twitter today, make sure you promote this show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll do it on Facebook. <laughs> okay. That's great. <laughs> John Gilstrap, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Take care. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, man. How much fun was John Gilstrap? I, I haven't laughed that hard in I don't know how long. All right. Let's jump ahead to next week. 
where we invite J.D. Barker to the show. J.D. Barker is written with a guy, uh, let's see, you may have heard of him, James Patterson. Yeah. Together they wrote The Noise. And that is next Thursday, the 27th of January, where J.D. Barker and I will sit down on the Thriller Zone and talk about, oh, I don't know, writing, thrillers, and such. Join us then. I'm David Temple. I'll see you next time on the Thriller Zone. <laughs>